Good evening and welcome to the April 27th, 2020 uh, work session of the Mayor and City Council. The uh, We have one item for discussion tonight, but it's a big item. It is the FY 2021 budget. And uh, for those of you who, who watch this uh, or attend our meetings on a regular basis, you'll notice we're doing this one differently from our usual work sessions uh, because a lot of what we're doing here tonight is is discussing uh, our reaction adjustments, potential amendments to the budget to to um, reflect the reality of the uh, COVID nineteen pandemic and its impact on our economy and, and future revenues. Uh, before I turn it over to Tony and Rafiu to lead us in the in the presentation, I want to go ahead and move to public comments. We have. One person signed up for public comments tonight. It's Lynn Nash, uh, tech team. If you could bring Lynn up, and Lynn, when you are uh, when you're ready, just state your name and um, start your testimony. Thank you. My name is Lynn Nash, and I live in Saybrook. The city council is already has an expected budget shortfall of 3.5 to 4 million due to the lost revenues during COVID-19 response. It's likely that the expected county revenues may not entirely be transferred to you. And as a result, you need to cut some programs and a number of projects that you are already planning. I just want to state, I don't want any new taxes. You shouldn't even consider new taxes, especially when your citizens are reeling from COVID. People have lost their jobs and they're having a hard time putting food on the table. Residents have watched their investments uh, go up in smoke, which will have a catastrophic impact on retired citizens especially. To make up for the budget shortfall, you will have to make some really difficult choices. One choice cannot be leaving the three police positions vacant. Crime is on an upswing. Some easy choices are any costs associated with a proposed school in Kelly Park. You made that decision knowing that you had, had a budget deficit. I don't want a single penny to go to it. But also, I don't want artificial turf because that's not environmentally friendly. Times and budgets have changed since you asked Tony to negotiate with MCPS. You need to pull back your support of the project. And to be frank, you need to pull back on anything new on the west side, the wealthiest side, the east side deserves as much representation and consideration as the other side of 270. It's time to treat us equally. So Mayor, kick your book festival to the side, stop overtime, stop any design and construction that hasn't had a shovel put in the ground, and that includes Consumer Product Safety Division, the park, it's on the west side. Crown Historic Park, it's on the west side. Discovery Park, it's on the west side. Bike Share Pilot, Pilot in Crown and Rio, it's on the west side. Stop the construction of, of a synthetic field in Robertson Park, it's on the west side and it's not healthy or environmentally friendly. Pedestrian Pass over Great Seneca. Gaithersburg needs to continue to be a pay-as-you-go city, and that's what I do with my finances. We need to tighten our belts, which means no support of, news of a new school right now and a dial back to programming and capital improvements. And if you want to remediate the overcrowding in our cluster, you need to tell MCPS that they should take care of the kids who live in Gaithersburg first before busing more kids in. Let's have a balanced budget and take care of our own kids first. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lynn. Um, and for anyone uh, listening or who right now or who sees us in the next few weeks, um, you are welcome to email us um, any comments you'd like on the budget and they'll be considered just like oral testimony. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Tony and Rafiu and let you guys do your presentation. Thank you, Mayor. Brian, if we could get the presentation up. It's packet page five. <clears throat> Or, or anyway, back, at, back at page five, just to cover slide. Brian, you can go to the next slide, please. So just a few introductory comments, um, how, how we expected to go tonight. Um, we've already heard from the public. Um, I'll give you a brief overview of uh, the revenues and expenses. 
Um, we'll move into individual slides that cover individual areas of uh, the expense budget, starting with personnel, then we'll go into some specific departments, and then in the uh, slides that constitute transfers, um, which would be asset replacement and the capital improvement plan. Um, we just want to acknowledge that this, is, this has really become a multi-year challenge for us, as I think I mentioned last Monday. Um, we're, we're no longer looking at this as something that can be solved in a single budget. Uh, we, we'd love to be wrong on that, but we, we don't think we are, and most other governments would agree. Um, so this is a little bit of a different process, um, as opposed to going through and, and highlighting increases in the budget, we're actually going through and highlighting decreases. Um, typically in work sessions uh, previous years, you would, we would get a comment from the council maybe on every 10, 10th or 15th item. Um, but these are 40 or so items that um, staff has already flagged as something that we'd like to get specific feedback from you on. Um, so it, it's possible that you will comment on the majority of them, if not all of them. Um, which is why we'll have the individual department heads called up as we start. Um, we did cut the expense budget um, pretty severely, and we expect some restorations, frankly. We, we don't expect um, that every single thing that's proposed to be cut is something that you're going to um, think that should be cut right off the bat. Um, we, we, as I said last Monday, have no intention of proposing any change to the tax rate or any deviation from our pay-as-you-go policy. Um, some of these are cuts as opposed to deferrals, um, especially in the asset transfer lines. Um, and we'll try to distinguish between those um, as we go through the presentation. Again, nothing is final. Um, we will be making adjustments and reporting back to you right up until adoption, um, just a couple weeks before the June date. Um, so with that, we'd like to just go, go ahead and get started and we'll, we'll <clears throat> quite a bit of uh, feedback back and forth. So the process itself is ongoing. As you know, uh, we did a lot of preliminary budget development in the early months of the year, which all of which pretty much got cast aside due to the interim revisions that we had to, to make due to the COVID-19 emergency. Um, we did. We held the pub, budget public hearing last Monday, and we got some kind of overall feedback from you, um, and a good bit of public feedback as well. Um, this session we expect to be a little bit different. Um, staff presentations with additional details, specific details about um, what's going on both in revenue and expense. <clears throat> Excuse me. And as I mentioned, we'll have subsequent revisions um, till mid-May, um, just as close as we can get to the adoption in June. Okay, Brian, so if you go forward two slides to the proposed revenues. Thank you. So this is where, where we are right now. We, the, we are looking at about a $3.3 million uh, reduction in revenues, um, about a million five in local taxes, which would be um, hotel motel taxes, which we expect to take a big hit, 30% or so, admissions and amusement, probably 35 um, personal property taxes are, are going to be taking a hit as well. Licenses and permits, a little bit less. Um, the Planning Code Administration um, sees licenses as, as being fairly stable, and um, a lot of permits might get pushed, um, but they didn't see a huge reduction. Um, grants and shared taxes are down about a million. Um, most of that, I believe, is income tax. Uh, Charges for service. I mean, we, we won't be having as many programs um, as we had in a, would have in a normal year. So that's down about $900,000. Fines and forfeitures is almost completely in um, speed camera, um, which actually was a, um, in, in, in acceleration, no, no pun intended, of reductions that we've seen in previous years. Uh, miscellaneous revenues. Um, are mostly our interest in investment income. Um, we're, we're seeing about a $200,000 reduction there. And that all of that, um, when combined with the expense cuts we're going to get to in a minute, in a minute um, results in an increased reappropriation of $575,000.
um, that is probably where if you reinstate things back into the budget as we go through it tonight, that's probably the number that will move the most. Um, we were expecting to use um, somewhat more in reappropriation. Um, so that's matching up pretty well um, if you want to put stuff back in the budget. Um, next slide, please. On the expenditure side, um, we are looking about an $800,000 reduction in personnel. Um, I, I, you, you can't, <clears throat> to Ms. Ms. Nash's comments earlier, you can't put every detail in a PowerPoint, um, but the three police vacancies will be filled. <clears throat> we just don't have an academy to send them to. Mm. Um, so we do not know when those will come on. Um, other vacant positions will be held open and other, uh, some hiring will be frozen. Um, operating expenditures down, uh, looks like about $800,000. Um, capital equipment was a smaller amount, but it's, it's quite a bit of that uh, line. Contingency remains at 500,000. We really need to stay nimble here. Um, and the CIP was really reduced by about $1.7 million and Dennis will be getting into that um, later in the presentation. Um, so about a $3.3 million cut on the expense side as well. Next slide, please. One more. So we're going to start with personnel. As I mentioned last Monday, I mean, that's where 65, 70% of the entire budget is. So thus that's where the money is. We had originally proposed a 1.5% cost of living, which is based on the November consumer price index for urban areas as it is every year. Uh, and then a 3% merit um, for people who qualified for it. We did leave a 1% merit in the budget, but we are reserving that to make a decision mid-year about whether to award it. Um, that represents about a $400,000 savings going from 3% to 1%. Um, the existing vacancy hiring freeze um, would be at least 90 days into the next fiscal year. And um, on, on your advice, last Monday to be strategic, we did um, say that three new positions could be added at mid-year contingent upon fiscal conditions. If we get different information in late May and June, then, then these would also be kind of on the block. We do have a, a police officer candidate position open. Again, we don't have anywhere to train that person, but there's always the possibility of a lateral hire. Um, <clears throat> we have a public works project manager that currently works part-time that we have been wanting to upgrade to full-time for, for quite a while. And uh, rental housing um, is, is just such a handful. We've, we've got to get more boots on the ground to, to complete the once every two year inspection of every unit. Um, which is unusual. We, that's one of the things that we do that kind of sets us apart from some other local governments. Um, so we did approve that one as well. Um, all the other proposed FY21 positions were eliminated from this budget. Um, unless we have any questions on that, we'll, we'll switch to community and public relations. Okay, so we go back a slide. I, I see you. Uh, first, Ryan, then Neil. Uh, Thanks, Tony. The question I had was about the new positions and the positions added mid-year. Um, I think you and I had had a uh, talk on the sidelines a couple of weeks ago about some additional potential strategic hires, for example, services that we might contract out to vendors that might actually be cheaper and save us money if we brought them in-house, things like custodial services. Um, is that still uh, in consideration as part of the strategic limited hiring or is this list here pretty much all we're thinking of at this point? Um, it, it is. It was a, it kind of an, an ironic twist, Ryan. We, um, w one of the positions that were cut and we may reinstate very late in the year, maybe in the last couple of months of the year, were custodial positions. Um, the contract custodial positions are actually quite expensive. And with these are people who be working in the new police station who need um, security clearance effectively. And we were going to upgrade two part-time contract positions into a full-time position. So um, it's still something that we'd like to look at. Um, we've had some success on that in public works. 
Um, but the custodial positions, we, we decided not to move forward until possibly very late in the year um, when those would be brought on board. Um, we would be saving money on those positions plus those, those employees um, may be eligible for benefits and you know, retirement that they're probably not getting now. Thanks. Well, a quick follow-up question also. Um, uh, the public testimony that we heard earlier tonight um, made a passing reference to crime being on the rise. Do you, do you know, or is Chief Sroka available to kind of just give us a quick heads up on what that data really says? Because, I mean, that, that might... The Chief is on this call. It should influence the, uh, you know, the decisions that we're making about uh, police officer hiring, among other factors. Tech team, do you, do you want to bring up the chief? Hey, chief. You're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Crime has been decreasing for four consecutive years from 2016 through 2019. For the first quarter of this year, which covers January through March, we're at a four tenths of 1% increase in crime for the first quarter of this year. The biggest increase we're seeing is in thefts from autos. Um, I don't have the data for April yet. I'll have that the first week of May, um, but we're seeing a slight increase again, of four tenths of 1% so far this year. Thanks, Chief. Thank you, Chief. Neil. You don't need to call on me. I was gonna ask the question about the crime rate as well, because I've been following the numbers uh, over the years, as the chief just said, and uh, especially on the more, you know, violent type crimes, the numbers have been decreasing pretty steadily for a long time. Just lock your car doors and we'll do better. I believe that calls for service during the emergency have been fairly low, um, other than domestics and um, the petty crime type things. Is that correct, chief? Yes, that, that is correct. Um, we've seen, we're seeing about a 40% reduction in calls for service. Our biggest calls for service are on domestic violence related calls. Um, social distancing was on, on an uptick. That has actually decreased here uh, in the last several weeks. Um, and we're also seeing an increase in mental health related type calls. Thank you again. Any other questions before Tony resumes? Not seeing any, go ahead, Tony. Okay, so if we could um, go to the next slide, please, and call up uh, Britta, I believe. We have Britta. Hello, good evening. Good evening. Okay, so we are Looking at total proposed reductions of 113,000 in the community services and the public relations side. Um, we are not proposing any reduction in grant funding. Um, community services staff um, does have their eye on the $30,000 that is earmarked for STEM, um, which has not been used so far this year, but is still in the budget. Um, we're looking at media training, uh, freelance services such as photography and uh, freelance writing, for some of our printed and, and uh, social media pieces, the state of the city, catering, voiceover, and the teleprompter rental. Um, police station construction signage would be would have been big graphic signage on the construction fence outside the, um, the, the project, um, which is always a, a, a nice touch, I think. And then homeless resident workshops of $12,000 were to be replaced with either in-house services or they were gonna look for services that were being provided by other um, community service agencies, um, kind of pro bono. So Britt is here to answer um, questions on these, these six. So, so Tony, the way this is working is what you're presenting to us are the proposed cuts mm -hmm. um, where we would save and the question before the council here is essentially, are you good with it? And, and so yeah. I, um, I see a couple of hands. I saw Neil first, let's go to Neil. All right, thank you, Mayor. Um, so I guess my question after last week's meeting is, uh, are there areas like grant funding for nonprofits where we're thinking that we might want to increase even in this difficult time and find reductions, greater reductions elsewhere? 
given the current environment, uh, you know, the safety net probably needs to be strengthened. Uh, the local agencies are going to be struggling to meet demand for food and shelter and whatnot during the crisis. Uh, are we, you know, thirty thousand dollars being reallocated from STEM seems like a drop in the bucket based on our normal grant funding budget. So, are we thinking that we may need to increase the number over last year? I'll defer to Britta on that one. I mean, I, you know, of course, we we recognize that there's going to be a tremendous need in the coming months. We did receive additional funding through CDBG grant money that we had not yet identified um, how we're going to use. Um, if it's any indication, we already have about 35 housing cases um, in review right now for people who've requested assistance just with April rent alone. Um, and of course, our food organizations are really being tapped to their extremes. So to the extent that additional money could be made available, certainly, um, the economic I mean, the uh, Educational Enrichment Committee and Community Advisory Committees have a joint meeting next week on the 5th of May to talk about how to take the pot of money. It's about a million, 38,000, I think, um, in funding across multiple pots and look at its highest and best use. Given other support programs that may be out there from a county, state, and federal level and CDBG level, and then what the right number, you know, what, what we can do with what's left or what you have agreed to allocate to us to really put that to its highest and best use. So that'll be a discussion next week. But if there is more money available, we would certainly welcome it. Ryan. Thank you, Mayor. I was gonna ask the same question that Neil asked, um, similar conversation that we had during the budget cycle uh, in 2009 after the Great Recession. Uh, and I believe then we ultimately um, did increase uh, our social safety net nonprofit grants. Uh, obviously, some of the dynamics right now are different than, uh, than in 2009, um, but it was a conversation worth having then and it's a conversation worth having now. Um, but my other question is really about the interplay between uh, funds budgeted for certain uh, programs and events and services for the current fiscal year that haven't necessarily been spent versus what we're talking about with respect to the proposed next fiscal year, which starts July 1. So when I see things like, you know, reduced costs for the state of the city event, and I know I'm jumping the gun here, but we're going to start talking about uh, reduced costs for a variety of parks, rec, and culture events and programs as well in one of our upcoming slides. And I'm seeing, you know, cancel this event or reduce that event uh, to save costs. I'm having a little trouble sort of um, connecting the dots if, for example, an event that we otherwise would have had this fiscal year was canceled already, um, so we're not expending those funds for that event. And some of these events that we're talking about are a year away. Um, are we considering how the saving of the expenditure in the current fiscal year sort of connects with or doesn't connect with our ability to afford some of those events in the coming fiscal year, especially since some of these events are, you know, a year or more away from today. Um, and things might be a little bit different then, but I also think uh, there's tremendous value in our cultural uh, programs and our communal gatherings, particularly uh, when this crisis is over and we all need to reconnect face-to-face, uh, -face, and we're talking six or nine or 12 months from now, um, do we really want to be seriously talking about saving a little bit here and a little bit there to cancel some of our important events, um, especially when they're so far away and especially when we've saved the money from having done them because we canceled them this year already? Does that make sense? Uh, that's sort of what I'm trying yes. to And we, we brushed upon that last Monday when we talked about how we were going to end FY20. And you know we are going to dip into the reappropriation in FY20, um, not as much as we had had budgeted. Um, and something like the state of the city um, is not canceled. It's it's just has less, uh, you know, less catering, and, and the teleprompter is actually really expensive. But um, what are you guys <laughs> doing sorry, to me I, here? I love that thing. Uh, but these are the types of things that. You know, you, you could put in the budget and then 
mid-year decide whether to actually spend the money. Um, we're in that situation with a lot of things already, though, um, like camps, like pools. Um, and we're wondering how far we can get into you know, that gray area of money that might get spent and money that might not get spent. Um, and it also kind of connects to the, the um, assertion that this is multi-year, that we just don't expect this to come back in one fiscal year. We're trying to keep powder dry for FY22. Uh, that being said, I did start off with saying, you know, some of these things, you know, we're expecting you to put them back. Um, sounds like we're hearing some support for the okay. grants. Um, but, you know, it, it may come down to just how much reappropriation re you want to spend um, in this year in preparation for the next. So I, I saw Lori Ann's hand go up and then and then Mike's. Um, I'll just say if we get rid of the teleprompter, I move that the council members hold up cue cards for our next state <laughs> of the city. Okay, Lori Ann, please. Thank you, Mayor. I just want to echo the sentiments of my council members. Um, the uh, nonprofits are really filling in a huge gap for us right now. And I know that we're going to go through the budget a little bit more, but I think um, our caller may have brought up some CIP projects or other areas where we may not um, need to make the investments, but the immediate investments. And I think that's going to be evident when we get down to um, uh, our other departments. Um, so I definitely would like to see um, some more reallocations for some of the immediate investments to our nonprofits and seeing how we can also look at other ways to address the ongoing concerns. I don't know what the uh, projections were based on um, regarding the usage of the uh, fund balance. And I know that you're projecting further down the road. So I'm, if we can talk about those numbers as well, how much is being borrowed in future years when we get there. Okay, well, you mean by borrowed, you mean from, the, from our savings, not- Yes, exactly. Okay. That's being reallocated, yes. Okay, that's actually um, was one on the first slide. We're looking at, I think it was uh, an increase of almost five hundred thousand dollars, five hundred eighty thousand um, dollars. You're currently at two point five million projected use um, versus one point nine for this year, I believe. Maybe one point. No, I think F, the current year, FY twenty, I think is about two million. Yeah. But we're going to use about five hundred thousand of it. Okay. Technically, I'm, uh -huh. we kind of sort of saved a million and a half. Depends on how you look at it. Okay. Um, so I, we're I was looking actually, at two point five already with these numbers. Okay. I was actually looking at uh, fiscal year twenty two through twenty four. Mm -hmm. I see that six million is being projected, five million, and then eight million. And so I'm just wondering why we are dipping into the fund so much. What are the anticipated needs? Um, that we are projecting. I would need, uh, we, can, Randy, are you following uh, which numbers? Yes, uh, they are the 2022 through 25. Those are actually driven uh, by our capital needs. <clears throat> as we talked about, as our capital needs increase, we don't have enough revenue to fund all of them. So we're trying to make sure we balance them. As we continue to review our entire budget, and try to make sure that uh, our capital uh, projects and all our transfers are, are budgeted within the current revenues, which is gonna be difficult for us to do because we still have a lot of capital needs. That's really what we're using them for. Okay. So the, the capital budget often gets smoothed out as we get closer to the years. Um, okay. <clears throat> All right, we're gonna to go to Mike and then Neil. So, um, you know, I, uh, I, I agree with everything that's been said about helping our uh, nonprofits, our partners there and, and uh, addressing the needs, which I think are gonna be considerable. So I, you know, the one question I had is about our uh, uh, programs for homeless. Uh, it's, it's likely that homeless numbers might actually increase when this is over. 
uh, given all the other things that have happened. So, but I don't know enough about what those workshops offer and how we could do that in-house. Um, I think um, to, to what uh, Ryan was talking about, I think we have to be very careful uh, going forward. I know there's going to be a sense of urgency to kind of get back to normal, but we're not gonna have a normal until there's a vaccine and we're still a year away from the vaccine. Just because we're done uh, in a month maybe and you know back uh, to our our to a, a routine of uh, being able to go out we're still going to have to social distance we're still going to have to be very careful and so I think that we have to uh, keep that in mind and then the other part of it when we when events are scheduled the planning for those events actually is sometimes a year or nine months six months in advance so you can't just say let's go ahead and do those without having some regard for that planning and then realizing that you might have to cancel it uh, later. So I think we have to, we just have to be careful about that. Um, I don't disagree that it, it's going to be important for uh, reestablishing ourselves, but I think um, uh, just, just a note of caution. Um, this isn't over until there's a vaccine. And so we have to uh, keep in mind what, what I think the science is telling us and what the epidemiologists are telling us about about uh, this and how we recover uh, from all of this. So uh, the worst thing would be to start up and go great guns and then have to freeze it again. So anyway, uh, just some comments okay. there. Mayor, can uh, I clarify the issue of the workshops? Go right ahead. Um, for the purposes of this slide, it's listed as homeless resident workshops, but it's actually in the program activities category for homeless services, there were several things that were proposed to be eliminated if need be. Workshops were part of it. We did reserve some funding for vocational training for our residents at Wells. Um, but we also looked at eliminating some of their team building activities. Their, you know, sometimes the attendance at Narcotics Anonymous Conference, which may probably not happen in the real world. Um, some other team building activities they do like movie nights and bowling nights, which while important, um, we figured in the current environment may not happen anyway. So that's part, that's also included in that workshop line. Thank you, Britta. Well, I, you know, I, I think, you know, we have to be very careful. I think those are some of the most, that's one of the most vulnerable populations and one that, that is having the impact. People in recovery are, are really under a great deal of stress right now. And, and there are people that we don't know about who might, you know, be getting close to the edge. So we have to be, uh, aware of that, cognizant of that, and, and be ready to jump in if, if we can, if we're able. But I think, um, as everybody has agreed already, uh, who's spoken, is that we really want to do as much as we can to, to uh, optimize uh, this part of our budget. I also Neil. want to mention- Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Britta. In, in the current furlough situation with part-time employees, um, when we were looking at staffing floor wells, we actually added a few part-time hours for street outreach, recognizing that we're probably going to see more people out on right. the street. So we did okay. increase our hours for that. Good. Neil. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I would just like to follow up on my earlier question regarding uh, money for the nonprofits and, and follow up on something Britta said and just try to clarify um, so uh, if I remember correctly from the giant budget book, the amount of money that we provide to nonprofits is something in the range of a million dollars a year. Uh, and you can correct me if I'm off base on that. But um, Britta, you mentioned something about some grant money that was received as a result of the COVID crisis. Uh, is that money allocated toward uh, redistributing to nonprofits? And if that's the case, what's the amount of money that we're talking about? Um, if we received additional notification from HUD of additional funding through the CDBG program, and frankly, that's administered through Louise Kaufman's office. I don't have those numbers at my fingertips at the moment. I believe, Tony, if I, I don't know if you have it either. I want to say 250000 but I could be wrong. <laughs> yes, it's about that. 250000 yeah. And yeah. It's, um, um, it can be used for resident assistance and business assistance. Okay. And there is a task force that's meeting to talk about what to do with that additional CDBG funding. Right now, a good chunk is used for our housing assistance down payment program and also for um, um, eviction prevention programs for our residents. 
Okay, but that gives us a good start toward assisting nonprofits be above and beyond what we already would have budgeted. So that's what I was, what I was hoping to hear. It may not be enough, but it's, it's not a small amount of money. Thank you. Any other questions before we move? Yeah, Rob, go ahead. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to comment that, you know, I agree with the approach that my colleagues are talking about here. It sounds like um, we're going to have to be flexible going forward um, because we don't know the situation as it, it develops. Um, so the question I have is, is it worth, instead of removing line items from the budget uh, for specific items, um, or if we are going to do that, increasing contingency to give more flexibility down the road once um, the, the factual circumstances solidify, so at least we have a placeholder in the budget to reallocate those funding, that funding going forward. Very good. Okay. Well, that was the easy slide. <laughs> <laughs> Can we move to parks? Bye. <laughs> Thank you, Britta. Okay, are we, Tony, are you inviting in Carolyn? I, I was, yes. Okay, tech team, bring in Carolyn, oh. please. Were they waiting for that? Yeah, they were waiting. Okay. Hi, Carolyn. You're Thanks. muted. How's that? Is that better? Yeah. Much better. Actually, I had okay. some conversations with her, and I'd actually like her to, to lead this slide and go through it. Um, some of the terms are not as familiar to me as they are to her. Okay, very good. Um, so going through the Parks, Recreation, and Culture budget that we had originally proposed, we have uh, gone through and made some additional proposed reductions. Um, the first one on the list you'll see are artist and partner revenue share, and that is um, at the Arts Barn, when we have our theater productions and our uh, artist exhibits and artists who come in as instructors in our classes, there is a revenue split. Um, for example, our theater partners, we have a 60-40 split with them. Um, we are expecting, uh, over all of our partnerships, we're expecting about a 30% decrease. Um, we've already had two shows canceled for the beginning of FY21, so um, we, we are seeing that there will be some issues there as well, so that is that first line. Um, second line would be our winter lights, supplies, and decorating. Um, we are looking at several different special events. Some, the ones that are, are listed here, are ones that we had proposed potentially eliminating. We do have others that we're looking at um, not completely eliminating, but they may show up in a different form. Um, our Cantlands Kent Mansion programs, our uh, programs at the Community Museum, including the new uh, telescope and display at the Benjamin Gaither Center. We're looking at holding off in the purchase of some new equipment, an elliptical machine, and digital signage for the Benjamin Gaither Center. And then Obviously, our summer programs are definitely up in the air. Um, so if you would like to go through, I can go through each line by line or if there are specific questions, whatever your preference is. Ryan. Thanks. So going back to what I uh, was mentioning earlier uh, in the last slide, um, and you know, I, I certainly understand uh, Mike's point about the fact that it's going to be a long time before we're back to normal and we're not assuming that we're all going to be back out and engaging in full-fledged uh, special events or recreational programs anytime soon. What I'm trying to understand is um, how some of these budget decisions might impact whether we're able to even have certain events a year or more from now and to what extent you know the budget uh, because it will go from July 1 of 2020 to June 30th of 2021, to what extent we, we risk committing ourselves to a decision to eliminate an event, you know, in, in spring or early summer of 2021, 
which is more than a year from now, bearing in mind that we will probably still have uh, levels of social distancing even when we are back out of our houses for many months. Um, my, my concern is I don't want to be committing necessarily now through the budget process to say that a particular event is definitely canceled because we made a budget decision in May of 2020 that is going to impact May of 2021. And so that's what I'm trying to get a handle on, how, how much flexibility we have here uh, when we talk about uh, the special events bullet on this slide. Are we talking about, you know, eliminating uh, all of these events uh, completely? Are we talking about just sort of reducing the scale of them, which I think is something very different and might make a lot more sense? Um, and, you know, how much does this end up becoming an operational or administrative decision by senior leadership or staff, as opposed to something that we're really determining right now in the budget process. That's what I'm trying to get a handle on. I uh, definitely see your point. I believe most of the events that we are looking at are, are events that will take place or were planned to take place either this upcoming summer or fall. There are a couple of events, as you can see, that would be this time next year. Um, but most of them include, um, the, the ones that are listed here are really just a, a small portion of the ones that we have uh, proposed. One would be Summerfest, which is obviously coming up in July, um, looking at a couple of different scenarios, whether we do something with just fireworks, if we do fireworks and have one ban, or if we cancel that event altogether. Um, we're looking at Oktoberfest, um, cutting some of the programming on Market Square and Market Street West, um, eliminating the horse-drawn wagon. That would save us approximately $19,000, just in reducing that footprint, but not eliminating that uh, event. Um, the Labor Day Parade, if we were to cancel that, that's an additional almost $20,000. Um, looking at outdoor concerts, um, if we can't maintain social distancing over the summer, our summer concerts this summer would be about $4,900. Um, backyard concerts are an additional $2,000. Um, the Thursday morning concerts, what we were looking at is canceling the five concerts that are scheduled for this July of 2020, but keeping the four for June of 2021. And that represents a savings of about $3,200. So there, there are a lot of different, there's, there's a lot of finagling that can happen within this special events line that we don't have to completely cancel certain events. We can scale some back. We can, you know, look at different events that perhaps this summer are less likely to take place given, you know, whether it's, uh, social distancing or whether it's the groups of people that are allowed to gather. Um, does that help answer some of your questions? I, I think so. I mean, I think that kind of reinforces what, what I'm looking for, which is that the cancellations and the scaling back, a lot of it has to do with this summer or this coming fall, as opposed to next spring or next summer in our calendar year, which is still within the next fiscal year. Uh, so, I mean, that, that's kind of what I'm trying to distinguish between, and I think you answered the question. If I could just add, we, we do have certain advantages of timing. Um, for example, if, if we were forced to cancel or severely curtail Summerfest, um, we don't have to make a commitment to Oktoberfest mm -hmm. in May or June. And the money could roll um, to that event if circumstances allow. Um, so the, 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 the public, as we know, doesn't really pay huge amounts of attention to what's in the budget book. Um, and the budget for special events is the budget for special events. It's not for a specific special event. So we do have that kind of in our pocket that we don't have to say we'll have no Oktoberfest or smaller Oktoberfest until we've made a decision about what Summerfest is going to look like. That's, that's one strategic thing we have in our, in our favor. All right, we're gonna go to Rob and then, <clears throat> Neil, you raising your hand? You're next. Rob, go ahead. 
Thanks, Mr. Mayor, and, and thank you for the, the summary of the expected um, revenue savings over the next in the next budget. These topics. Um, I'm kind of where Ryan is on this topic, and I would I would urge you to take a look if you haven't already done so. Actually, I'm sure you have, but in separating out into two categories, basically one would be the events that you're looking for. Uh, cost savings on simply because you need to find cost savings in the budget make those decisions and and eliminate them so that we would have the cost savings but on the other ones that you're talking about scaling back for example or you don't know um, how they're going to go forward because uh, you don't know the nature of social distancing um, but you think the program is worthwhile and you want to save it you know I'm looking at a, a, a like Labor Day Parade, I think would be one that's worthwhile and one that I wouldn't want to see um, fall under the cost savings acts. Um, but leave enough in the budget to allow for the full programming of those events that, that are worthwhile but may be impacted by future events um, so that we have the latitude going forward um, to respond to um, circumstances as they develop. And so um, I, I guess my point is, is, is I would encourage two pots, is, is cost savings and then possible reductions for events that would be impacted by, by events going forward. Thanks, Thanks. Rob. Uh, before, before I go to Neil, I just want to make a quick comment about Labor Day Parade, um, to your point. You're right, that, that's, a, that's a tough one if we were to have to skip it or we were to, or eliminate it, whatever the, the case is. Uh, because we've done like 80 of them in a row. And, and so there's a, there's a tradition here, but at the same time, you know, I was just on a, a zoom call with, with about 50 book festival directors from all around the country. And a lot of them were, you know, have events, their book festivals are in, in the fall and September, late August, September events, even through November, people are canceling events even now. Uh, for that period of time. So I, I, I just say it's, you know, whether or not we, we want to keep Labor Day Parade, it may be the right thing to do. We may, we may not really have a choice. Rob, go ahead. Rob, you're on mute. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Could I just respond to that? Because that kind of goes into the point I was trying to make is, you know, I'm looking at the list and I'd say, you know, maybe we want to do cost savings on outdoor concerts. They're kind of ancillary. Um, we'd make the decision now to save money on those. For the Labor Day Parade, where I would say it's, it's one of the essential type of, or signature type operations that we put on, we budget for it and then make the decision based on the facts going forward, but we plug it into the budget now as a fully funded event and then we respond to it later. A point taken, I wanna to go to Neil. Uh, before or or Carolyn, did you want to chime in on that? No, or, I'm just, I'm taking notes. <laughs> okay, all right, we're gonna go to Neil then, Mike. Neil, go ahead. So I think we need to understand something, which is that the social distancing thing that we're doing is not going to suddenly disappear overnight. If things get better by June, we may be able to do some things, but we're we're as Mike said, the science is that we're not likely to have a vaccine for quite some time. And what we don't want is to get back to normal and then suddenly have to come back and retreat to our homes and close down all the businesses again. So I think realistically, as much as I love the events, I love Summerfest, I love Oktoberfest, the Labor Day Parade and so forth, those are events that are designed to bring people out in big crowds. I don't see how we do them uh, given the, likelihood that there's still going to be a virus floating around even if it's diminished it's not going to be gone and we don't want to bring it back again so I think that um, that we're going to need to rethink uh, these events to the point where we're likely to have a year off on a lot of them as much as I hate to say that but um, and in in terms of uh, Rob's point about leaving them in the budget as a as a maybe that means we have to cut somewhere else because we have we want to balance the budget and we don't want to have extra money in and, and some things that are, are less likely so i'd make a much more prudent choice and pull a lot of these events out of the budget for the at least for the duration of this calendar year thanks neil 
and at the same time, if we do have to to cancel Labor Day Parade, something you know as signature as that this year, um, Carolyn, I'm sure you and your staff would take the opportunity to find ways to to improve it. To you know, take this time to think of ways to to jazz it up and reinvigorate the event. Um, that said, I'll go to Mike. Uh, yeah, I think uh, you know Neil. Uh, said what I was going to say about this. And I think some of these events, it's impossible to do social distancing. You can't have a parade. Uh, I mean, you can, you can spread the parade out and the people marching in the parade, but uh, you remember what it's like uh, as we go down the street on the trolley and you look at the crowds, there's no way to police that. So I'm sure that we could uh, keep these things on a calendar and consider them on a rolling basis, but you have to do it your, your decision point has to be two or th three or four months, you know, before the event. Um, you don't want to, you know, you, you don't want to eliminate things or to hope that cancel them once and then hope they come back again. But I think it is something we have to think about. I think in some ways, some of the smaller events, the outdoor concerts and park performances might actually be easier for some social distancing within the neighborhood. And there actually might be more important in terms of uh, providing some entertainment and diversion for our, our communities and neighbors in a smaller setting and a smaller scale. So, um, so we just, uh, as you know, I'm on the, uh, the KCF, the Cantlands Community Foundation Board of Directors uh, as the city liaison. And um, we just, uh, had our uh, Zoom meeting to talk about plans. A uh, number of events have already been canceled and the big event that they're having to make a decision about is gonna be, uh, and another one that we're quite involved in is the, the 5K, the Kenlands Lakelands 5K. It's gonna be very difficult to maintain social distancing in a, in a race like that with, with the crowds, but even with, just with the runners. So, you know, that's the major fundraiser for the Community Foundation. So. Um, and then uh, rather than trying to, to make sure that, that you can keep everything on the calendar and figure out some way to offer it at some level, I think there was consensus that, we, that, that the foundation had to make some hard choices and just go ahead and say, we're not gonna do it this year. We're gonna have to figure out how to do it again later. So, I mean, that starts with, uh, with Kentlands Under the Lights uh, and various other events as well, the annual board meeting, all of those things. Uh, so keeping that in mind and keeping in mind that they do a lot of things in partnership with the city, those were, uh, those were important considerations. So I think, um, I think we can certainly encourage staff, but as Neil said, if we, if we keep these on the calendar, then we have to cut something else. And I think there's, there's lots of things, lots of places in the budget where we're gonna have to look for stuff that they're all gonna be difficult decisions and no one's gonna be happy about them. But I think, um, you know, we're not doing this, um, you know, it's, I think we have to be strategic here and, and be careful and keep in mind, you know, what we're working with here. So. I could uh, add just a little nuance. Um, you know, Rafi and I have had this discussion that, you know, under, under gov generally accepted accounting principles in a government setting, you know, you're supposed to try as, as, as well as you can to budget what you're actually going to spend. And this situation does not lend itself to that. You know, it's really a challenge, which was kind of placed to my point that, you know, events are events to the public and to the budget. And we might be able to kind of get around that constraint by making a rolling allocation for events. And then as we go through, you know, allocate funds. I mean, we're, we're fairly certain that the near term events, which are in this fiscal year, are not going to happen. The summer, you know, we can't even make a decision about the pool yet or camps. Um, which, you know, these events are a rounding error on those, those budgets. So ironically, if we end up not opening the pool, that actually saves a lot of money. Um, and we could reallocate within the park's budget to try and keep these types of, of, of performances and parades, things going when they're available, if they're available. And I, I think Judd made a good point on, uh, and Mike on, um, you know, reinvigorating. This might be a time to step back and 
you know, come back bigger and better in the following year. Could be. Um, any other questions or comments on this slide, guys? Not seeing any? Okay. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you. And we're going to public work, so tech team, I guess we're bringing up Mike Johnson. And I, I see Mike, we got him. Good evening. Good evening. Tony, you're on mute. Sorry. Um, Mike has come up with some proposed reductions about $385,000. Um, the first was actually mentioned on Monday, which was suspension of seasonal hiring. Um, we have sufficient crews. We're only calling in about a third of the crews each day right now um, to take over those functions. Um, we did propose some cuts to repair and maintenance of facilities, um, deferring some projects. Uh, the two main ones were the geothermal heating systems at the youth centers, um, which have not aged well. Um, a reduction in the custodial contract uh, custodial contract. Um, I mentioned before we might actually bring the custodians on board like in the last quarter of the year. Um, and then in engineering services, um, I would like, uh, I assume there'll be some questions about that. I'd like Mike to just um, take those directly. I'm not familiar with the Safe Reefs to School study. High mass lighting are the um, ball field lights. Um, and the engineering inspections um, associated with that. So with that, I just open it up for questions. Mike, did you wanna add some background on those items? I'm sure, yes. Um, the high mass lightings uh, um, are, as Tony mentioned, are the uh, ball field lights. That are, these are the 20 lights that are in the Lakelands Park that are in um, area C. We have divided the city into three areas, A, B, C. And uh, each of the structures in those areas are inspected um, on a three-year cycle. And this is be the cycle for these lights, which um, based on records that we have, have never been inspected. Um, we can't find any inspection records since they were installed. It's a good practice to inspect them as um, high winds or other um, frozen connections can cause um, sometimes transfer cracks in the structure. And uh, it's a safety measure as the lights are quite high and uh, do pick up a fair amount of uh, wind loading. Uh, we, uh, for, we feel though that um, we could defer that possibly a year without much problem. And that's what that item is for the high mass lighting. For the uh, safe routes to school study, um, as everyone is aware in Montgomery County, Montgomery County has a fairly high incident, uh, incidents, pardon me, of um, motorists not obeying the school bus, uh, the, the, the rolling stops that the school buses have. And um, we were partnering, planning to partner with the um, Montgomery County Public Schools to uh, do a study of uh, the various school zones within the city as part of what we uh, deemed, uh, what we named um, safe routes to schools. And that would sort of help to um, introduce some engineering controls into the um, behavior of motorists and the general um, access for pedestrians, largely um, younger pedestrians who tend to have um, shorter attention spans and are shorter physically and therefore harder to see for motor distracted motorists. And um, that study, which was uh, around $45,000, uh, was felt that it was um, an item that we could defer possibly again for another year. But we feel that we really uh, strongly feel that it's a, it's a good partnership between Public Works or the city and Montgomery County Public Schools. Questions, comments? Mike, Sesma. 
Uh, can we talk about the deferrals, Michael? Um, uh, can you describe exactly what those might be, the, the project deferrals? Of, um, you know, I, I did go through the, the spreadsheet that we got, but um, maybe just describe them. Uh, what are we deferring oh, yes. and what do we, um, I, I think one of the issues we had in, um, you know, a decade ago was deferrals that actually ended up costing us in the long run. So uh, just tell us about those things. I'm sure, yes. No, the, um, the firm that we've, we've hired for, um, to, for this cycle would be inspecting um, the pedestrian bridges uh, in the parks. Um, the um, bridge that uh, crossed, goes across um, to the parking garage over the CSX line. And as part of that uh, contract, um, the third part was the high mast lights in Lakelands Park, the 20 lights. Um, the, we, we felt that um, in terms of relative risk, that the high mast lights have a lower relative risk than the um, pedestrian carrying structures, the bridge. Mm -hmm. And as such, we uh, plan to defer the inspection for one fiscal year. And it would be picked up in when area A is being inspected, um, which would occur in fiscal year 2022. 20, so that basically is what that deferral is. It's not, um, and it's an effort to sort of help to balance the 21 budget. Um, to well, offer what about the, you, you've listed three, a couple of items and then et cetera under facility project deferrals. And so I was just wondering what those. The what, uh, city hall project. Oh, the, I'm sorry. Yeah. Mike, I think I'm pretty sure the city hall project is the um, waterproofing oh. uh, drainage project around the foundation of the new part of city hall. And then the youth center, uh, they have geothermal heating systems mm -hmm. that have uh, fluid filled pipes that go deep into the ground. Right. Um, that are probably going to fail in the next few years. Right, right. Pardon me. I, I thought you were asking for a bit more clarification on yeah, that. Yeah. Services. Yes, as Tony did mention that, and um, the also the um, side window replacements at the police department, at the police station, okay. police station, those would also be deferred as part of that as well. So, so these are items that we really feel that you know if we deferred them, mm -hmm. here, that it would not really be um, like a life safety issue or anything of that nature, but it. It should be done probably within the you know fiscal year twenty two. That be our recommendation. Okay, thanks. You. I will admit that the uh, the two engineering services one were were not cuts that I originally was comfortable moving forward with, and and we're not one hundred percent sure we still are. Um, you you may see those back. Thank you. All right, appreciate it, MJ. We will move on to the next slide. So the other departments, um, there's two slides. Uh, the uh, total for the four are $212,000. Um, Raffi is on the call now. They had proposed a summer internship um, at $9,000 and then they were going to make reductions um, to conference and travel. Uh, RAFU has a, a quite a robust training program and we've got a lot of new software um, that needs a consistent training but they've, they've uh, indicated that they could save this amount. In HR, um, Kim is also on the call. Uh, Wellness Day, um, the main event of Wellness Day is, is the flu shot. Um, we're not really sure what Wellness Day is going to look like um, because it's going to be hard to socially gather people for Wellness Day um, to get vaccines. So um, that's a little bit of a work in progress. Uh, recruitment expenses, you know, are just kind of got reduced organically because we're, we're doing less recruiting and, you know, the first quarter we would be in a freeze anyway. Um, some training programs, which tend to be our partnership with Montgomery College, um, for um, new supervisor training, CPR, those types of things. Um, and then we would move the, uh, the employee picnic back to the water park um, as opposed to the, um, I guess it was, I'm not sure what the place was called, up, up near Black Hills. 
Um, the place in Clarksburg. Park and reduce some of the catering. High point. I, thank you, Mike. Um, so these were just you know operational, um, kind of for the good of the order cuts um, that these two two departments um, have offered up. Questions, comments. Okay, not seeing any. Go right ahead, Tony. Okay. Next slide, please. Hey, I see Mike raising his hand. Uh, okay. So, um, I, yeah, I, I don't know what the wellness day was, but I would certainly say that we benefited greatly from our wellness program. The fact that we got a nine hundred thousand dollar rebate this year on because our our employees are filing fewer claims is is pretty important. So I would want to make sure that that we're continuing to invest in that program uh, and those efforts. So this seems like just part of that effort, but I still think, you know, vaccinations are important too <laughs> for other diseases besides the one that we don't have a vaccine for. So I, anyway. I think um, HR was thinking of it in the context of not being able to have yeah. the event, which is in the fall. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Um, so four other departments, um, IT um, offered up some cuts to part-time staff and some consulting services. Uh, the city attorney um, believes that we could save about $10,000 in outside council services. Um, in the CMO's budget, um, we had identified the visioning exercise as a deferral. Um, and then plan code administration also had custom conference and travel. And um, originally the rental housing inspector position, which would be new in FY21, would generally require a vehicle. Um, but uh, the division head has determined that they would give up their vehicle and make it a pool vehicle for the use of the new, um, the new person. Questions, comments? Not seeing any, go right ahead, Tony. Okay. Uh, so I, I was expecting specific questions about the visioning exercise. Uh, does anybody, I mean, are you guys okay? Or is that, that would, that would make a two year gap between the original exercise and then the follow up. Neil, let's hear from you on this. I'm volunteering you. Thanks. I appreciate that. Um, you know, the, it's a tough call. As much as I'd like to see it move forward with, uh, with greater uh, velocity, uh, we're not sure what the world is going to look like after, this, after the virus is cleared up. So I think uh, holding off on that and coming back after there's some more clarity for what the, what the near future looks like is probably uh, a prudent idea. Thanks, Neil. Appreciate your reasonableness. Uh, Mike Sesma. Yeah, I was going to back that up. I basically say the same thing. I said, we don't know what our normal is going to look like. Um, and our, you know, our starting point for the visioning exercise was based on something that we may, we may never see again. So I think we're going to have to wait until things uh, shake out. Um, that's, that's the best approach, I think. And then, you know, hopefully we'll be able to incorporate other aspects of the city's uh, redevelopment and growth when we do that. Any other questions or comments before we go back to Tony? Not seeing any? Go ahead, Tony. All right, I believe the next one is transfer to funds. Um, if Dennis is on the, on the dais already, I guess I just can't see him. So this is probably the area that we have the most change in terms of kind of deferring items that we would normally try to do. We did take a very uh, logical approach and looked at the mileage on the two animal control vans, also on the Thomas bus, and then you know for the public works air compressor, we'd look at hours used. We do feel like we could get an additional year or two out of some of those components and are comfortable with deferring the purchase of those two items for those items listed. Mike Sesma. Mike, you're on mute. Yeah, so where's the Walder Park playground? Is that on the east side or the west side? 
<laughs> That's really the question. <laughs> I have to look that one up, to be honest. It's on the east. I, I, I'd say we cross that one off the list. I mean, uh, go forward with it. Um, since there seems to be this uh, uh, feeling that, that uh, the east side is neglected. I just don't remember where that park is. So. It's, um, it's in Deer Park, um, kind of behind City Hall. Um, okay. Uh, I mean, we, the PW did, uh, you know, they, they have a schedule, just like they do with every, right. everything else, and Walder Park was next. But um, the equipment, frankly, does not get a lot of use in Walder Park, and it, it, it looking, it's looking to extend the useful life. Um, those um, folks actually can literally walk to Griffith Park at well, as well, which has mm -hmm. a new playground. Okay, well, I, you know. We rely, we rely on the judgment of our staff, as always, so just was, I couldn't remember where Walder Park was. Mike, I mean, not Mike, let me address this to Tony. Um, Post-employment benefits, tell, tell us more of the thinking there with that number. We had increased the OPAB contribution this year by two or three hundred thousand dollars to continue to close the gap to get to the actuarial number. As I've explained before, once you get to the actuarial number, you don't actually have to make any contributions anymore. Um, but um, A, it was, you know, we feel like we need to try and get some money from just about everything. But B, um, the fiscal conditions nationwide probably suggest um, that people that were looking to retire, um, you know, in the next two or three years, may be deferring that a little bit. And we thought, you know, $100,000 might be um, an appropriate re reduction for, for this year and then just pick it up next year when we can. That is something we also did in 2008. Thank you for that clarification. Go right ahead. Any more questions on transfer? Dennis goes to CIP. Fine. Could you move the next slide? So in terms of the CIP, we really kind of took to heart uh, council's comments during the budget hearing and tried to look at projects that wouldn't have a long-term impact on the maintenance of the city's resources or facilities. Uh, the public works facility expansion, that's really a, a pretty far out project um, past the current CIP. So it would just delay uh, funding of that 875,000 um, to a future year. The two projects we would be placing on hold um, would be the 16 South Summit Art Project and the Old Town Art Project. Uh, we felt that those could be placed on hold and then funded uh, in a future year um, based upon what other priorities were needed in the CIP in addition, as you know, we did actually have to go back in and add additional funding for the field at the Kelly Park um, Elementary School. And that would only be about 100,000 in FY21. The majority of that would be in FY22. And keep in mind that would be a reimbursement uh, from the school district to fund that park. I can answer some of the questions if you'd like on the projects that were brought up as part of the public comments and kind of why those were not looked at in terms of reduction in the CIP, if you'd like, or if there are specific projects you want me to look at, I'd be happy to answer that. I'm going to ask a quick question and then I'll go to Lorian. Um, so on the art project, 16 South Summit and the Old Town Art Project, um, I see we're, we're looking at $260,000, just taking them out entirely, what was planned to be funded this year. My question is, are there, if we were to reduce them dramatically, but still leave a little in to move the projects forward in terms of the RFP, RFQ pro process and evaluating artists, if we can get that done during the fiscal year and then come back later when we're ready to fund it, is, is that possible? I think that's always possible for both of those. You know, we could move forward with the selection process. 
Um, we would need to put a little bit of money in those projects. It's usually not a whole lot, um, just because the artists who compete for those projects get a little stipend as part of the competition portion. So I think that is doable. Um, we could look at some other funding cuts uh, that wouldn't have a significant impact um, on some of the larger projects that we have. Yeah, I mean, if, if we could spend or dedicate a fraction, a small fraction of the money just to, just to keep the, the, the fire lit just a little bit, I think, I think it'd be good. Um, Lorianne, you were next. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Dennis, I know you're going to talk about some of the um, projects that were recommended that we reconsider for this fiscal year. Um, I also wanted to ask about um, the, the bicycle projects that we have in the budget this year that we're funding. And I also wanted to ask about the um, Travis Watkins Mill Stream Restoration Project. Is that budgeted in this year's capital improvement plan? Um, in terms of the bike projects, again, all of those are considered reimbursement projects through the transportation development tax funding. So in theory, they don't get us a lot of, ex they don't get us any extra money because we have to spend those on specific project types. Um, so those are why some of those weren't um, looked at for reduction. You know, and again, one of the projects that was also brought up was the pedestrian bridge um, over Great Seneca. Again, that's another reimbursement project uh, with AstraZeneca Metamune that's helping fund that particular project. On the stormwater project, I'd have to actually look that one up. Um, so give me a minute, or okay. I can get back to you on that. Usually on the stormwater projects, you have to keep in mind too that that's a separate fund. So we did not cut any projects from that particular CIP category because it's a dedicated fund that goes in and the revenue is pretty stable on that based upon the fee that's charged. While Dennis is looking that up, does anybody have any other questions? There were a few other uh, park projects that um, I don't know if Dennis is gonna um, refer to once he comes back. So if you're looking at one of the other ones was CPSC or the former consumer product safety site. Again, that project is fairly far along in addition, that one has money tied to it to POS. And so if we don't use the POS money, we do risk some um, ability for the state or the county to come back and indicate that we're not spending the proje project open space money. That's about a 50-50 split on that particular project. So that's why it wasn't something that we looked to cut in terms of funding. The what other about one the uh, discovery park project. discovery park is actually almost complete it will be complete and was scheduled to have a grand opening in june or um, early july uh, so that project is under contract and couldn't be stopped at this particular point in time a similar thing would happen at the robertson park um, synthetic field we have issued that contract the contract is under um, construction and that money, that project also has POS funding associated with it too. So it was not um, slated for um, reduction in price. Again, a lot of those had other funding mechanisms that if we didn't continue with those projects, we would lose or could lose that funding um, in the future. And was that the case for all of the bike projects or I know about the pilot program with uh, Rio and uh, Crown. There I'm are, mm -hmm. the majority of the bike projects are actually, um, other than some initial seed money, are mostly in FY22 in terms of the larger bike projects. Um, again, this is kind of a reimbursement. It's more of a pass-through. We, we have to have the cash in the bank in order to sign the contract but once we expend the money, we get reimbursed from the transportation development tax. Okay, thank you. The Travis um, stormwater project is currently budgeted uh, for FY21 portion of it is. Good, okay, thank you. All right, Mike. 
So I want to go back to project open space spending, uh, particularly for the, the parks. Uh, CPSC, I guess, is the main one. Not that I want to delay it, but um, do you expect, is, is there any sense that the state will have some flexibility on the ability of municipalities to, to carry out these projects given what's going on and may actually uh, allow extensions on use of those funds? Do you have any idea of whether that's going to happen or not? We haven't heard that from them. Um, I'm sure that's a possibility uh, for those projects. Uh, in particular, the one that would make the biggest difference would be CPSC. Uh, but again, we're at basically 90% design. Uh, we could make that decision should the circumstances change before we actually go out for a bid for that project. Um, and we've been able to juggle the rest of the projects in terms of providing the one point a little bit over 1 million in reduction in other ways. Um, so we tried not to hinder projects that were under construction or close to construction through the cuts that we've looked at. Okay, thanks. In previous years, highway user, bond bill money and program open space have all been recovered by the state. Um, so it's a little frustrating, but the, the timing is so condensed compared to 2008 that, you know, we're, we're just kind of waiting and see it, waiting to see it at the moment. But the timing on a lot of the projects, the Discovery Park is done, CPSC is teed up, um, it is, works to our favor. Lorian, you had another question? Yes, I did. A quick question. The uh, Travis uh, Watkins Mill project, can you tell me a little bit more about that, Dennis? And that's on the east side of the city, correct? Yeah. I. You know, to be honest, I couldn't get into specifics about the stormwater projects. I'd have to get back to you on exactly what that project entails. I can give you a general idea. For most stream restoration projects, we're looking at them for two accounts. One where the stream bed or the stream banks have degraded, and we're going back in and doing restoration projects, um, such as putting additional plantings. Um, but they also get us credit in terms of the credits that we have to do for the TMDLs or the total maximum daily load uh, requirements that we have under our MPDS permit. That's generally what those stream restoration projects do. Um, I could get more specifics from one of the stormwater engineers um, if you'd like. Okay, thank you. And did you say that the Discovery Park would be finished this summer? Uh, yes, that's what it's on target to be finished. So what, what is the 1.3 million in the budget uh, planned for? Is that correct? Or is that number wrong? I believe most of that is being spent this year. So really, um, we will have, we don't have any expenditures shown for FY21, yeah, all the expenditures in FY20. Okay. Can we find out what, what's being spent for uh, the remainder of FY20 if nothing's being earmarked for uh, 21? I want to make sure I don't have the number incorrect. Discovery Park, um, the re you know, for 20, the total is 1.4, almost 1.5. Okay, so that's already been spent. Okay. Um, the majority have it. Been spent. We still have contract. They still have paving to do. Uh, the flexi play, but okay. if you get by, the check after the job's done, <laughs> okay. and all the playground equipment is actually already in, and most of the landscaping is really the last thing we're waiting for is the flexi play, and that has to be above a certain temperature for them to lay it. So that's why it's being done so late um, in the fiscal year. Okay, thank you, Dennis. Tony, Dennis, go right ahead. Well, unless there's additional questions about CIP, um, the next steps would be on the next slide. Um, we continue to invite public comment, um, email, phone, mail. Phone and mail does take a little bit of time um, to get through to us, so the sooner the better if you want to use those uh, methods. Um, we will continue to make interim revisions. Um, I've got, a, again, another page of uh, guidance from tonight. Um, I'm sensing community service grants are definitely on the list um, and that we need to get creative with um, how we're staging our events and how, you know, being able to keep our options open on events. 
um, the wellness initiatives, um, the art projects or things that you have specifically called out as things that you'd like to be maintained, um, the art projects, if we could continue the process. Um, and there's other things going on behind the scenes that are you know, more just operational in nature. Um, but I, I think we can still bring back a budget that is um, reasonable and sets us up for future, you know, to address future challenges um, as they come. Um, if they don't come, they don't come, that'd be great. Um, but if they do, um, I believe we'll be prepared. Um, so we're pretty close to having a, a real budget, um, probably in the next week or two. Um, if it's two, then Mr. Enslinger, Mr. Ahile will be presenting it to you. Um, if it's one, I'll bring it myself. Um, otherwise, um, I, I think we've, we've gotten what we needed and we appreciate all the feedback. Tony, the only other thing I had to add is, you know, the only outstanding kind of capital improvement project that we have funding that we're not quite sure on yet would be 16 South Summit. Um, you know, as we're all aware, uh, the current proposed state budget includes a million dollars related to that particular project. So we would have to go back and really look at the CIP again, should that funding not be um, provided to the city. Yeah. We should know more after uh, the first week in May. And that's what I identified as bond bill money to go with POS and highway user. If we get bad news on any of those three, then we'll have to adjust. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, staff. Um, before we go, I just wanted to make a quick statement about uh, something that came up in, in our one testimony tonight. And I've seen some elements of that theme in our council discussion about east versus west and you know at this point this is 07 to this is my 12th or 13th budget process and um the any suggestion that at any point during that time and certainly i for as long as i've been paying attention to budget processes in the city has there been any uh conscious or uh effort to prejudice or, or, or bias toward one side or the other. In fact, um, the, diff the, the major differences between the east side and west side don't have to do with city actions. They have to do with when those areas were developed. Uh, obviously, the east side of the city was developed decades earlier than the west side. Uh, the west side coming in later had the benefit of modern planning practices and um, uh, and it obviously Kentlands and Lakelands were groundbreaking communities uh, that were that were planned in ways that not only was no place on the east side planned no place anywhere in the country had been planned at that point uh, with a, attention to detail uh, like they like they had in in Kentlands and Lakelands um, and so there is now we have newer uh, communities at Crown and um, and Parklands, and they're they they just develop differently. But it's not as a result of any sort of uh, bad faith or negligence uh, on on behalf of the mayor and council and city staff. Uh, as as a matter of fact, to the contrary, um, I've seen nothing but efforts from the staff and from the council. Uh, for the entire time I've been in office to try to balance the east and west side and bring and bring new life to the east side which had been developed so many decades before so yeah I I get it with if if somebody is is feeling uh, disgruntled or or whatever having a bad day and they come to us and they say you know what this my neighborhood or or the amenities I have don't look as good as as somewhere else it's it's sort of easy to point fingers that way but a lot of this happened organically and we have done we've made every effort to try to and we continue to make every effort to try to make all of Gaithersburg as great as it can be so I just I just wanted to end with that point and um, you know make sure we're everyone in the public who's you know all dozen people in the public who are viewing this um, understand where we're coming from. And with that, 
Um, I will note that the next regular uh, meeting of the mayor and council is next week on May 4th. May the 4th be with us. Uh, I feel ter I feel so silly saying that. Um, and, and until next time, let's do great things, Gaithersburg. We are adjourned. <laughs>